We have been following Paul around ancient Rome as he is on his second missionary journey. We're studying a verse by verse through the book of Acts and uh, really just looking at the, the powerful message that is being preached to the people in the Roman Empire. Today's message is entitled, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Paul has just, uh, we left him last week in Athens. And really, it wasn't a very powerful ministry that Paul had there. He went there to, to minister to those very intellectually elite in Athens, and not much came of it. You know, they, they kind of mocked him and laughed at him. Ha, <laughs> the resurrection. You know, and, and just kind of laughed him off. And, and he didn't stay there very long. Uh, he didn't turn the town upside down like he had so many other times before. And uh, we get the impression from the text that we're going to read today, not as much as what Paul is saying himself, but what the Lord says to him, that perhaps Paul is a bit discouraged. He's on the last leg of this second missionary journey, and he's been beat up and stoned and whipped and beaten many, many times, and, and now he's been laughed at. And, and so we get the impression that Paul's maybe a little weary. And so as we go into this text... Uh, I wanted to tackle the entire chapter. <laughs> I know you guys are thinking, oh my gosh, 28 verses. But uh, we're just going to read the first 17 right now, and then we'll hit the end of it, because it's, it's just kind of, um, um, you know, as we, as we continue on through the book of Acts, we're going to see a lot of, of, of passages that are getting you from point A to point B, and there's not a whole lot to uh, exposit in those areas, but we'll just make our way through it. And so we'll save that for the end there. But let's go ahead and read uh, verse 1, chapter 18. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them, uh, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation, they were tent makers, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook off, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord and with all his household. And many of the Corinthians heard, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid. But speak and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. When Galileo uh, was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord uh, rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves. For I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, uh, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo took no notice of these things. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Sincrea, for he had taken a vow. Let's stop there and pray together. Father, we do thank you. For this message, Lord, we thank you for this revelation that you have given to Paul. And and now it has been passed down to us that Jesus, your son, is the Christ, 
the Savior, the Messiah, the Savior of the entire earth, Lord. And we thank you that at this time we are now uh, called to pass that torch on, to pass that message on to the next generation. Father, help us in this endeavor. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I watched a movie just recently. You guys know I'm a big history buff. Valkyrie. Operation Valkyrie was an operation that had been set up to where if Hitler was killed, this operation would go into effect immediately. And it was, it was set up so that the nation of Germany would be saved in the event of the assassin, assassination of their leader, Hitler. And this operation would be put into, op, into effect, this plan of action would be put into action upon four very powerful words. And those words were, the Fuhrer is dead. And I don't want to give away the movie, it's a really good movie, but uh, the Fuhrer is dead. Once those words were said, man, this operation would go into effect. It was a very powerful statement. And, and so uh, without asking any questions, you would have to carry out everything that was laid out in Operation Valkyrie, in the, in the plan of action. You'd have to carry those things out to ensure that the nation of Germany would be saved. Well, as I was thinking about this, watching this movie and studying for the, the sermon this week, it reminded me of the fact, and of course I don't want to draw any conclusions between Jesus and Hitler and the church and the Nazi Germany. I don't want to make those distinctions at all. But these words that we have here this morning, Jesus is the Christ. You know, it's not his name, Jesus Christ. It's who he is. And once you find the revelation of that, once you discover that, Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus is the Son of God. Once that revelation hits you, there should be a plan of action go into, into your life. There should be a change in your life. There should be some things happen once you realize that. It happened with Paul. Once Paul realized on that road to Damascus, man, he's the Messiah. Once he saw that light, his life was changed forever. And now 30 years later, approximately, we see Paul going all over the world sharing this message. A powerful message indeed. You remember, Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some of them think you're a prophet, some of them think you're this, some of them think you're that. Who do you say that I am? You remember that very famous reply of Peter. You are the Christ. We have come to realize, we've come to know, we've had this revelation that you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And that was indeed a powerful revelation to them. But it really didn't go into full effect until later on. They didn't realize the intensity of that until much later down the road. But Jesus knew what that revelation meant. And it led him to say, on this rock, on this principle, on this revelation that you've just received, that's what I'm going to build my church on. On this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell, or the gates of Hades, shall not prevail against it. But you know, here we are about to embark on a brand new year, 2009. 2,000 years approximately after all these things that we're talking about right now. And it seems as though the church has been hijacked. It seems that, you know, the purpose of the church and the function of the church and what the church should be doing is not spreading this message any longer but taking care of social problems and attacking the evils of the day and, and solving the problem of hunger and, and AIDS and, and all these other social issues out there. But if you don't get this principle, if you don't get this revelation right here, if that doesn't seek into your heart, it doesn't matter how many people get fed. And it doesn't matter how many uh, cures of cancer and, and AIDS and things happen. 
If you don't understand this and you die and go to hell for eternity, what does it matter what kind of social problems we have solved? Preaching the message of Jesus Christ that He is the Christ, that He is the Savior of the world, and when people get that, those good works naturally come. But man, we have to focus on that message. Before He ascended into heaven, He said to His disciples, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Go out. Make disciples. That's what Paul's doing. That's what he's been doing for the better part of 25 years. And these words, I am with you always, He says that to Paul in the passage that we're looking at today. Don't be afraid, Paul. Keep preaching that message. Don't turn back. Don't let the society mold you in another direction. This is the message that I have for you. This is what you're supposed to be doing. Keep going. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'll always be with you. Keep preaching that message. Luke 24, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Mark, also, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Believe what? That Jesus is the Christ. That's the message. That's the function of the church. You want to talk about being purpose-driven? That's it. That's our purpose. And so, as we are about to embark on another year, how are we to carry out that message? I think it's a good time for us to refocus, to re-cage ourselves, as we used to say in the the military. Re-cage your thinking. Okay, come on, get your gyros re-caged again. Come on, let's refocus in on what we have to do here. Because certainly over the course of time, we get bewildered, we get weary, we get discouraged, as we see in Paul's life here this morning. And so a couple of things I want to encourage you with this morning as we embark on 2009. There needs to be a deviation from the norm. Paul's life was radically changed. He was once in line to be a great rabbi. I mean, Paul was going to go to the top. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He had zeal. And he was destined to become a great rabbi of the Jewish faith. But now, what do we find him doing? He's a tent maker. (laughs) He's making tents and preaching the gospel. There needs to be a change in our life. There needs to be a change in how we think. There needs to be a rededication to the mission. Having God console us again and tell us, It's okay. Don't be afraid. You're on the right track. Keep going. I'm with you. Keep going. You're doing the right thing. And there needs to be a discipleship of the masses. That is our our purpose. That is our function. And so, again, this missionary journey, it's coming to an end here. Last week he was in Athens. Now he is in Corinth, about 50 miles across uh, the land bridge over there in Achaia. He will eventually stop off in Ephesus on his way back down to uh, Jerusalem and then he's going to go back over to um, Antioch where he began. But this uh, area that he's in right now, if you look at the map here, very interesting, Corinth is here and it's a, it's a sailor town. It's one that I can relate to. It's a sailor town and you've got a little land bridge here. Uh, Athens is over here in this area. And so there's this area right here where uh, ships would come into this area and they would portage their vessels and their cargo over this land bridge and then take it up this way to Rome instead of having to go around this cape, which was very dangerous. It was said that if you were going to go around that cape that you should make out your will because it was an extremely dangerous. So several hundred miles extra travel here to go back up, treacherous travel. So they would portage across that land bridge right there and then go on to Rome. Later on, it was such a... Uh, challenge that later on they even cut a canal through there, the Corinth Canal. And so we see the vital um, 
strategic place that Corinth is at. It was a place where after they came across that land bridge, they would stop before their voyage up to Rome or wherever it was that they were going. And so it was a very vital port city. Um, but as many uh, port cities are in that day and even today, it was very corrupt, very perverse, um, lots of bad stuff going on there in Corinth. And so that's where we find Paul now. He leaves Athens, that center of, of, of um, intellectual thought and philosophy. He's discouraged as he leaves there, and, and it's like out of the frying pan into the fire. Now he's in Corinth, this really, I mean, just a disgusting place. Lots of uh, sexual perversion going on there. And so now, as we go back through this, verse 1 through 4, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. And so now we meet up with this very interesting couple, Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, we, we hear later on in the Bible that they had a church in their house. And so this really sweet couple here, uh, there's no indication here in this text that Aquila and Priscilla were Christians at this point. And so I think we have to make the assumption by looking at this that Paul, uh, being a tent maker, just became co-workers with them and eventually led them to the Lord. They came down from Rome, so certainly there there was a chance that they had believed up there and came to a knowledge, but certainly Paul had a, a much fuller revelation, and at the very least, he discipled them in their faith. And of course, they went on to become very strong Christians, uh, having a church in their own home. So a, a very neat couple here. They're making tents in Corinth. And again, this life change. Paul was a great theologian. But here he is making tents to provide enough money so that he could preach the gospel. And you know, as we look at our own careers in our lives, you know, we are often defined by what we do. You know, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm this. I'm a carpenter. I'm a, uh, you know, whatever. A plumber. I'm a trucker. I'm this. I'm that. Our occupation often defines who we are. But we see in the life of Paul that there came this deviation from that. No, I am a Christian and I am spreading the message of Jesus Christ and I just need to find some job uh, to help me do that. And so it's a totally different way of looking at our occupations. This job is providing an opportunity for me to take care of my family, feed my family while I am preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ while I'm making an impact on my co-workers, while I am spreading this message. And I think that's a good way to look at it. It's an amazing thing that Paul was a tent maker. As much as we know about, you know, the, the biblical in, implications of what a tent is, you know, we've talked a lot about that. I don't want to take the time to go over that again. But, you know, the, our body is spoken of as a tent. You know, it's this temporary dwelling place that our spirit lives in while we're here on this earth but it's not going to last forever it's just a temporary thing and so paul's job too is is just something to get him through it's a temporary thing something to help me get through this take care of my my own personal needs while i'm preaching the gospel of jesus christ and so Paul hooks up with this couple here. He lives with them for a while. I really believe that he led them to the Lord, at least discipled them in their faith in the Lord. And, uh, you know, it's interesting what the old rabbis used to say. If you don't teach your sons a trade, you're teaching them how to steal. And so the tent-making thing for Paul, that was something he he grew up with. The rabbis would, would teach their sons a trade so that if the rabbi thing didn't work out or times were tough or for whatever reason, they had something to fall back on. And so now Paul has fallen back on this. He, he is a tent maker by trade in addition to being a rabbi. 
All right, so it talks about the fact that the Jews had been kicked out of Rome. And this is very interesting. Uh, It probably happened about six years before this in that time frame, but about 20,000 Jews had been deported, kicked out of Rome. And in the ancient uh, writings of, of secular historians, one in particular, a guy named Suetonius, He says that because the Jews were in a state of constant tumult at the instigation of one Christus, he banished them from Rome. And this is very interesting because here is this Roman historian, probably in Rome, and he's writing the history of Rome. And and so, okay, the Jews have been deported. Why did they get deported? Why did they get kicked out of Rome? He's investigating this. Oh, there's this guy named Christ. Uh, you know, that's causing all these problems. And so many scholars believe that this is just another spelling or another pronunciation of Christ. He was spoken of as being so alive and and such a a real person that in the mind of a historian, oh yeah, there's a guy named Christus that's going all around. He's causing all these problems. And so that's why they were kicked out because this guy was instigating problems. This historian wrote down Uh, Christ as a real person because he is a real person and because in the lives of the Christians they believed that he was still alive and that he was working in their lives and so that's how it comes to the to the mind of a historian very interesting there was a tumult going on all over the ancient world at this time the Jews didn't want to believe in Jesus as their Messiah He's not a great ruler come to, to set us free from the Romans, so he's not our Messiah. And, and there was a great tumult all over, and we've talked a lot about that. But before we get away from Athens too far, again, I wanted to just look at the state that Paul is in right now. Why did he leave Athens? Why did he just take off? Why didn't he stick around for a little while? Again, he's about a year and a half, possibly even two years into this uh, missionary journey he's gone through some really really tough times and you know they say that uh, sticks and stones will break my bones but names will never hurt me but that's really not true those wounds to uh, our, our mental state and our emotional state when people make fun of us and mock us those are the wounds that really make a difference in our lives and, you know, we see here uh, in, in the end of chapter 17 that they were mocking Paul and, and some of them said, hey, we'll listen to you later. There was just really no acceptance of the gospel. There were a couple of people uh, that, that accepted it. But for the most part, there was no fruit that came from that. And so these things are wearing on Paul. A couple of things that I think we can look at. There was a discouragement from that mocking. There was no backup from a body of believers, brothers who were there to support him. You remember that Paul took off on his own and went down to Athens. He was by himself. And I think that's a a pretty good uh, indication for us that we should be with other brothers when we're out preaching the gospel. You know, um, I've talked to you guys a lot about being down at the mission and teaching down there at chapel night on Thursday nights and... and, uh, you know, it really makes a difference to me when there's another brother in that room. It really does. And as I've relayed that to you guys, I, I think that maybe you guys, oh, you just, you just want to have a bunch of people down there. But it makes a difference to me when I'm standing up there by myself and trying to relay the gospel to a bunch of people that really don't want to hear it. All they want to do is eat their food and go to bed and they don't want to hear what I'm saying. And I'm all alone up there and Nate all alone up there, and Ken, all alone up there, teaching on our own. It makes such a difference when there's a brother in the back, and we know that they're back there praying, and they're they're backing us up. We need that encouragement. You know, and, and we often look at Paul as just this island you know he's this pillar of strength and 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 man he can just go into a town and raise a ruckus and turn the town upside down and and he'd get beaten and stoned and then walk right back into the town and and yes paul did those things but towards the end of this journey at this point as he arrives in this very pagan uh filthy city he's a bit discouraged not from what we see in this text that we just read but from what the Lord tells him in the vision. 
Hey, Paul, don't be afraid. Don't stop speaking. Just keep going. Nobody's going to attack you here. It's all right. There's an encouragement there. And so we need our brothers around us, backing us up, our sisters there, uh, just encouraging us and strengthening, strength, strengthening us. The third thing I think here, we see that fear. We see some frustration as Paul just leaves Athens. Yeah, I'm out of here. I don't want to deal with this. Some weariness as this mission has rolled along. And so that's kind of where I think he's at. You know, the, uh, the, the town of Corinth, the city of Corinth, much like in Athens. We looked at all the, uh, the temples last week in Athens. You know, Corinth was no different. It was given over to idolatry and they worshiped Apollo. Here's the temple to Apollo and, and, and all these different temples and gods that they worshiped. And the Corinthians themselves, really, they were a byword for just drunken debauchery. You know, on movies now, when you see a Christian or a priest, you know, he's always portrayed as a child molester or, or a drunk or just in a very negative light. And what, what a grieving thing that is. But it's kind of the same thing with the Corinthians. When they would do a play and they wanted to represent a Corinthian, they would have this drunken sailor kind of coming through there. It's kind of like here in Humboldt County, you know, when you tell people from outside here, hey, I'm from Humboldt County. Really? Oh. <laughs> nudge, nudge, know what I mean? Know what I mean? Humboldt County, oh, right. You know, I mean, they give you that, well, I know what you do up there kind of thing. I had never heard of Humboldt County before I moved to California, but, you know, we have that image. And so the Corinthians had this image and they were just, you know, they live like Corinthians is, is, a, is a famous thing that they used to say. Oh, those people live like Corinthians. You know, they're just drunken idiots. And so the temple of Aphrodite, or Aphrodite, however you want to say it, this temple, this was the god of the community of Corinth. She was the god that they were sold out for. And why do you ask? Well, Greek mythology has it that Aphrodite is the goddess of love, beauty, and sexual rapture. And so these people were very sexually immoral people. And so again, Paul goes from Athens to out of the frying pan into the fire. I mean, and, and he's in this state of having to deal with this stuff. And we even see in his letter back to the Corinthians later on, is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. And so, you know, the, the sexual immorality was rampant there. They were a very carnal people. And the people who came into the church were still carnal because they had all this stuff going on in that city, things that were accepted, you know, incest and, and just the sexual immorality that was going on. They were proud of the things that they did. They didn't mourn. They didn't repent of those things. They were proud of them. And so uh, Paul had, a, had, had to write two letters to them to get them on the right track. And they weren't letters of, of praise. You know, it was condemnation about the things that they were doing and... and letters to correct the carnalness of them. And so, as we continue on here, we better get going. In verse 5, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. And so here we have Paul. He gets that second win now. You know, when he first got there, he was still kind of by himself. He was with Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, but... His buddies, his, his, his guys that had been traveling with him, uh, Silas and Timothy, they weren't with him. And so we see him in the synagogues and he's persuading people, but 
you know, it seems to indicate that once Silas and Timothy arrived, now he was refreshed in his spirit. And now he was just going at it once more. Uh, before, he, the, the Jews weren't coming against him. But now we're going to find that, that he's creating this ruckus that he normally does. He's back into uh, Pauline form, you might say. And so the, uh, the idea that he was compelled in his spirit, it could be easily translated, he was compelled in his spirit or, um, in, this, or in the spirit, either way. Um, but I, I think it's a picture of, you know, the, the Holy Spirit just refreshing us again, filling us anew and, and just giving us that refreshment that we need, that recharge. You know, we need to be coming to him. We need to be abiding in him and having his power working through us. You know, we are a channel we're a vessel for God to work through. And, um, and so we see Paul here now getting that second wind that he needs, and he really goes after it. Compelled by the Spirit, he starts to testify fervently again. Jesus is the Christ. And now they begin to oppose him. Now they begin to blaspheme him and, and start trying to run him out of town because now he's, he's got this new burst of energy going on here. And, uh, but he says, look, I, I've done what I've been asked to do. I've gone out and I've preached the gospel to you. And now if you're going to reject it, it's on your own head. Your blood is on your own hands. It's, it's your fault if you reject this. I've given you the message. And he's going to walk away from them after that. But it's very interesting what we see here um, in the end of that little passage is that some of those Jews eventually came to the Lord. He'd kind of given up on them. All right, you Jews, that's it. I'm going to the Gentiles. I'm, I'm done with you guys. But still, that seed was planted. And some of those Jews begin to believe in Jesus now. You know, I think it's, uh, it's quite amazing, you know, the hole that is left when, you know, just imagine if Paul had given up. Just imagine if Paul had said, all right, that's it. You know, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm going back home. I'm going back to Jerusalem. I'm going to go live down there. I just can't do this anymore. It's too hard on me. I'm going to give up. What a hole would be left there. Uh, Charles Spurgeon used to speak about the, the portraits of the great merchant rulers of Venice. And there was a palace, and still to this day, there's a palace that has all these portraits of these great merchant rulers of Venice. And as you're going down the hallway and you're looking at these pictures... There's a spot there where there's no picture. There's just a black curtain hanging there. And that black curtain was one of the merchant rulers who uh, committed treason and was executed for it. And they removed his picture and put a black curtain there. But of all those pictures hanging on that wall, guess which one draws the most most attention? (laughs) That black curtain, that missing picture. Hey, what'd this guy do? He, he drew back. He put his hand to the plow and then he, he turned around and left. What a hole that leaves when each one of us, when each one of us get tired in the work and we give up and we turn away and say, I can't walk with the Lord anymore. It's too hard. I can't serve him anymore. What a hole you leave. There's a black curtain on your chair that you used to sit in. Don't give up. Don't give up this year, this coming year. Be renewed in your spirit. Come and, and worship here with us and let the Lord renew you. I watched the It's a Wonderful Life just recently, of course, for Christmas. I have to watch it every year. Remember what Clarence said? Each man's life touches the lives of so many others. So true. Only you have the sphere of influence that you have. Your life interacts and touches and, and, and brushes against so many other lives. And when you uh, fall into sin or when you walk away from the Lord and stop serving him for whatever reason, there's an awful hole that's left there. And now those people who you were meant to minister to aren't being ministered to any longer. Well, Paul continues on. And uh, it's an amazing thing that even after he says, you know, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. You guys aren't going to listen to me. Your blood's on your own heads. Still, that seed is planted and these guys come to the Lord. And I think that tells us that we cannot give up on people. We often get frustrated and we see people that, oh man, that guy will never get saved. I'm, I give up. Well, I'm awfully glad my wife didn't give up on me. 
I'm awfully glad my family didn't stop praying about me. And for those of you out there, I know there are many that, um, you know, your children aren't walking with the Lord anymore and they've walked away and, or you're afraid they're going to walk away. Um, you know, I just want to encourage you to not give up on them. Not to give up on anyone, not just your children, but just anyone. Because even though they're giving you the face of opposition and blasphemy, God's working in their heart. That message has gone out and it's made an impact in their lives. Uh, I've told you guys often that I was in the Navy at one time and I retired from the Navy. But I don't think I've ever told you that originally I tried to go in the Coast Guard. <laughs> Got a whole new story now. But it's not, a, it's not a good story. You know, I took about two years off before I went in the military after high school. And in those two years... I became a Corinthian and uh, really continued that on even after I joined the Navy. But during those two years, my parents, I remember my parents began to look at me in a certain way and my my family and and they were looking at me like, man, you got to get out of here. You need to do something with your life. You're going to, you're going to destroy your life. You need to go. They knew I was doing drugs. They knew I was drinking. They knew I was hanging around with the wrong people. And they said, you really just, why don't you join the military? Why don't you do something? Once you go somewhere, just get out of here. And so I began to look into the military, and, and I thought the Coast Guard would be the way to go, and I went up to MEPS, and I tried to get in, and, and they said, well, you know, we've got an issue here that we need a waiver for, and we'll let you know. We'll send you a letter and let you know if we're going to let you join or not. So I told my family, you know, I tried, and I'm waiting to hear back from the Coast Guard. And... One day, my dad had given me a ride home from work, and I was living with a couple guys, a little party pad there, and uh, he walked up the walk with me, and as, as I was getting my keys out to open the door, uh, the letter box was right there, and my dad saw a letter that said from the United States Coast Guard on it. And he said, son, here's, here's your letter. Here's, here's your letter from the Coast Guard, and he was very excited about it. And he said, here, open it. And I said, no, I'll open it later. No, come on, open it. And he opened a letter. And it said, We're sorry to inform you, Mr. Mustin, but because of your excessive drug use, we cannot allow you to open to join the military at this time. And (laughs) I remember the the discouragement on my dad's face. Sorry. (laughs) He just dropped his face and he dropped the letter and he, he just kind of walked away. And I knew at that point that he had given up on me or he was feeling like giving up on me. But here we are today. (laughs) Don't give up on anybody. Don't give up on anybody, okay? And don't give up on this town either. Don't give up on Eureka and Humboldt County. As we look out and we see so many lost causes out there, we look out and we just see, man, these guys will never get saved. It's just a hopeless case. We see the, the way that Satan has destroyed so many lives. And we, we think, wow, there's no hope. This city will just fall. And there's no way that we can save it. But it's not true. You go out and do what Jesus told you to do. Preach that message. Tell people that Jesus is the Christ and you must believe in him. You must repent of your sins and believe in him. And don't worry about the rest of it. He'll take care of the rest of it. And certainly he does here. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. What are you sowing? Of the flesh or of the Spirit? Let us go and let us not grow weary while, well, while doing well, For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Keep on sowing to the flesh. Or to the spirit, I'm sorry. (laughs) No! Let me back up on that. Don't do that. Keep on sowing to the spirit. Don't grow weary in due time. In God's time, you will reap. Keep planting those seeds. Okay, so 
Now what we have here is a, a rededication to the mission. God is going to give Paul another vision. You remember the first vision he was given when he was there on the, on the seashore at Troas. God had told him, don't go that way, don't go that way. And so he's going straight and then he gets to the water's edge. What do I do now? God gives him a vision. A man over in Macedonia, come over here and help us. Now Paul's being given another vision, a con- reconfirming vision for Paul. Verse 9 Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak. And do not keep silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. A year and a half more, Paul is able to stay there. And of course, plants this wonderful church that grows and, and, and really has a major impact in that part of the world. Don't be afraid. You know, again, it's not in what we saw Paul doing. Paul was probably, you know, doing what he thought he needed to be doing and kind of going through the motions, but it took that, that compelling of the Spirit, that refilling of the Spirit, this vision, Paul, don't be afraid. Just keep on going. I'm there. I'm with you. I'm always with you till the end of the age. I've got many people here in this city I've spoken to their hearts. I've worked in their hearts. I'm moving them and and directing them and leading them. And you just don't worry about it. You just keep on doing what you're doing, Paul, and I'll take care of the rest. And of course, we have that assurance knowing that if we are doing what God has called us to do, if we are doing his will, he will protect us. He's not going to let anything happen to us while we're in that will. Now, if it's his will for us to to be martyred or to be taken out at some point or to die of a disease even. Even in that, when we're walking in his will, it's okay. It's okay. And so he stays there for quite a while longer. Uh, I wanted to go into this passage in 1 Kings, but we just don't have time. But Elijah's reality check, you remember he thought, I'm the only one left, Lord. There's nobody else. I'm the only one. And God said, get back to work. Get back up there. You got work to do. Get back up there and you appoint some kings here and they'll take care of business for me. And, and, and oh, by the way, I've got 7,000 people in Israel that haven't bowed the knee to Baal or kissed the idols of Baal. Don't worry about it, Elijah. Go back to work is kind of the idea. So I wanted to go back and look at that, but we need to keep moving here. And so what a mission field we see here. You know, God dwells outside of time. He dwells outside of eternity. He knows the people that are in that city that are already saved and who are already worshipers of God, who are ready to come to the knowledge of Jesus being the Christ. And he knows those people that will eventually come and and those people, their kids who will eventually come and their grandkids. Because he dwells outside of that. And he said, don't worry about it, Paul. You just keep preaching. I've got a lot of people that need to come to faith in this city. I'm moving in their lives right now and you just need to preach. Don't be silent. Keep speaking that word. It is a tremendous mission field. You remember uh, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say, and he's talking to his disciples, there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they are already white." For harvest, And of course, he was looking out into a field of people who were coming back from the city after he had told the woman of the well who he was. And she went down there and she said, come and see a man. Come and see a man that knows everything that I've ever done. Come and see the Christ. He had revealed to her, I am he. I am that one. And so these men from the city are now coming to see Jesus. And Jesus says, look out there in that harvest field. You see him? The field is already white for harvest. It's already white for harvest. You know, we're always praying for those revivals. What did Jesus say? The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. It's never about there aren't enough people that want to come to know Jesus. It's never about that. It's about laborers. 
People who are willing to do that deviation from the norm in their life and rededicate themselves to the mission of discipling the masses. There need to be more laborers. I can't do it all on my own. I can't. So God has created the church so that I can get up here and I can equip you. How many people are in this room right now? There's a bunch. And so you become equipped and then you go out and you disciple the masses. And that's what we're seeing here in the life of Aquila and Priscilla. They're going to go out and they're going to plant a church in their home and they're going to talk to a guy named Apollos, another Paul. And he's going to become another powerful minister of the gospel because they were faithful to go out into that mission field. So as we uh, come close to wrapping this up here, <laughs> verse 12, when Galileo, the proconsul of uh, Archaea, uh, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul. So now Paul's making a, 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 a ruckus here in town and they're going to rise up against him. Paul brought him to the judgment seat saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge over, of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat, and all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo took no notice of these things. And so the judgment seat, they're bringing him to this Bema seat and, and judging Paul. They want to bring him before the, the Roman ruler and accuse him and say, look, he is, um, he's persuading men to break the laws of Rome. But here we see a demonstration of God's promise to Paul. Look, I'm going to protect you. Here we see it. He has people coming against him and God is right there protecting him. Let God defend you. You worry about your character. You worry about your integrity and God will take care of your reputation. Paul's just about to start speaking, but, but, but. And God's already got Galileo there to protect him. And Galileo says, oh, you Jews, don't worry about it. I'm not going to judge these things. It's a matter of your own religion. You deal with it. I'm not going to deal with it. And so we see them um, getting very angry and taking... You you remember that Crispus was the other ruler that has now become a Christian. So they've appointed another ruler, Sosthenes. And uh, he, we believe, probably comes to the Lord as well. Um, uh, Let me do this first here. Roman law allowed for proselytizing, but not of Roman citizens. That's the accusation. You know... In Rome, in the empire of Rome, they let you go around and try to convert people to your religion, but not Roman citizens. If they weren't a Roman citizen, they didn't care. And so that's what they're trying to say. Look, Paul's trying to break this Roman law here. And so um, Galileo was the brother of Seneca, a Roman philosopher. And, you know, he's been criticized for this passage here because they look at it and they say, look, he took no notice of these things. He didn't care that this priest was being beaten. But that's not the idea. He was a very uh, nice guy, according to his brother. He says, no mortal is so pleasant to any one person as Galileo is to everybody. And so um, Galileo has gone down in history as being a very nice guy. And so perhaps the Jews were trying to take advantage of him in some way. Um, but he just said, look, I'm not going to judge in this matter. You know, you guys judge on your own, but I'm not going to be a part of this. And so they take the second um, ruler of the synagogue, Sosthenes, and they put him up there. And this could be a guy who also comes to the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. So it could be that this guy was going up to argue the thing before the, ru- the ruler there. And maybe he wasn't strong enough in his argument because he was going to eventually become a Christian himself. And so they took him and they beat him. Who knows? We don't know exactly. It's a little bit uh, hard to tell uh, from the text there. But um, anyway, moving on here. Uh, verse 18 
So Paul still remained a good while and then took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Sincrea for he had taken a vow. And so now Paul again is rededicated to that mission. He's taken a vow to, to keep on teaching that message, to keep on selling out for the Lord. And uh, so as we end out here, I'm going to just read 19 through 23 because it, it's just getting us from here to there. There's really nothing to comment on. Uh, and he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must, be, I must by all means keep the, this coming feast in Jerusalem. But I will return again to you, God willing, and he sailed from Ephesus. So he takes off from Ephesus, verse 22, and when he had landed at uh, Caesarea, I'm sorry, my, my text is broken up. One part's over here, one part's over here. Caesarea, and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. After he spent some time there, he departed and went over to the region of Galatia and Phrygia, in order, in order, strengthening the, all the disciples. So we have here the end of the second missionary journey and, and the beginning of the third. Paul is recommitted to this mission. He's not going to waste any time. He goes back to Jerusalem, says hi to him, goes back to Antioch for a little while, recuperates for a little while, and now he's back in Galatia one more time. Now, the reason I wanted to finish up here uh, with this last passage, Paul has now reproduced himself. And of course, that is the goal of, really should be the goal of every one of us as a Christian to pass my faith on to the next person. And that is what he has done here. He has, he has discipled uh, Aquila and Priscilla and in turn, they have discipled another man named Apollos. And it is the idea that we have that healthy sheep beget healthy sheep. We shouldn't just be uh, preaching the gospel every morning from the pulpit. Repent, be saved. Repent, be saved. There needs to be an equipping here so that you become healthy in your faith in Jesus Christ so that you can go out and reproduce that faith in the lives of other people. Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Who does that sound like? It sounds like another Paul, doesn't it? fervent in spirit. Man, he knew the Bible. He was raised knowing the Bible and being able to teach it accurately. But he only knew, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. The Messiah is coming. He only knew up to that point. He didn't know the whole story. He only knew, repent, the kingdom of God. You need to bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. And so he's going around and he's telling the synagogues these things. He's being bold about it. And as he's there in Ephesus, when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. You're missing one thing, Apollos. You're missing one thing in your preaching, and it's, it's the key. It's the key to the whole thing. And when he had desired to cross... Uh, what did they teach him, actually? They taught him that Jesus was the Christ. Jesus was the fulfillment of what John was talking about. Yes, the kingdom of God was coming at the end of John's ministry. And he did come. He came. He was the Christ. He is the Christ. And so we see now Apollos going out with this message. Paul has reproduced himself by proxy. And when he, cross, and when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Nate, you want to come on up? We're going to get these people out of here. Hurry. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. I, I, a, lot of, a lot of text, but I didn't want to break that up. 
We began with Paul preaching it. We end with the reproduction of that. And now another man is taking that very same message out in a powerful way. Maybe you can't identify with a Paul. Maybe you can't identify with an Apollos. But all of us can identify with a couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. We can teach that way more accurately to the people in our community. And so in 2009, I want to encourage you to go out with that message on your lips. That is our purpose. That is what we are being driven to do by Jesus himself. Go into all the world. Make disciples. Maybe you're not called to go overseas somewhere, but you are called to speak that message. And maybe the person that you tell it to will become an Apollos, will become a Paul. You just never know. Father, we thank you so much for these things, Lord. I pray for this congregation, Lord, that we would become equipped to preach the message that you have asked us to preach. Lord, I ask that in this coming year, Lord, that you would renew our strength, that you would give each of us that same vision not to be afraid, not to stop speaking, Lord, but to be even more bold to be compelled in our spirit by your spirit to go out, Lord, 